Welcome back to the War Room. Fight fans from around the world, I am your fight goddess, Chris Baldwin, and I'm here with my fight family, Mr. Eddie Goldman. We call him the Conscious of Combat Sports. And my sister, Melissa Smith, she is an, oh, you know what? You should win an award. I was about to say you are an award-winning uh, author, but you should be an <laughs> award-winning author. <laughs> you are a women's boxing historian, and we are in the house today to kind of get you guys caught up on what's going on in the world of boxing with Kenahan, with the IOC, because if you didn't know, our amateur program at the Olympics is kind of uh, under, on the, on the, oh, we're about to lose that maybe, you know, it's like on the brink of collapse. So we need to chat with Eddie today. He's going to give us a rundown and then we're going to, uh, moving on over to Melissa and we're going to talk about a little bit of women, women's boxing. All right. So Eddie, take it away, my brother. Well, do you remember the old rock and roll song from the 1960s that was made popular by Neil Sedaka and written by Howard Greenfield, both of Brooklyn, called Breaking Up is Hard to Do? I love that song. I, I loved it when it came out. One of my favorite songs was a strange song because it's a lament about a guy loses his girl and he's pleading with her to come back but it's this upbeat song dom dooby do dom dom you know and they, you could uh, dance fast and all that. And in any case that song is now being sung by thomas bach the president of the ioc to his uh, old pal who is uh, broken up with him his lost lover vladimir putin because the whole relationship between the IOC and uh, Tsar Putin's Russia has fallen apart. And this was was interesting. It was recently revealed a few days ago by Bach at an IOC press conference is that not only has the relationship, quote, dramatically deteriorated over the past years, unquote, but he accused Russia of being responsible, quote, for personal threats to individuals. He would not specify publicly what they were. So here you go. For years, they tried to appease this Russian mafia regime. This is what Russia is. It's a mafia state. It's not just an ordinary, even authoritarian state. You have criminal elements directly running and profiting the government and everything is related to that. So when the do the state sponsored doping scandal developed, they appeased Russia. They said, oh no, you can't appear in the Olympics under the name Russia. McCoy, the Russian Olympic Committee, you can't play the Russian national anthem, which by the way, on, on its own is a wonderful song if one of the best national anthems in the world but you can't play that you can play tchaikovsky and you can't wear the russian flag on your uh, uniforms but they can be in the colors of the russian flag and you'd be called neutral athletes from russia or russian olympic committee or something like that which included russia in the name so everybody knew what that was really about then they didn't turn over the data from the Moscow lab that they had manipulated and that had been exposed by Dr. Rachenkov, who had to flee Russia and apparently is living in hiding somewhere in the United States. They didn't turn that over in time. And what they did turn over had been doctored. They weren't supposed to doctor it. But the IOC still just slapped them on the wrist and when they try to give them a four-year suspension, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which is controlled by the IOC, reduced it to just two years. It's just one thing after the other where they just appeased Russia and Russia just laughed at them. Russia violated their Olympic truce in 2008, in 2014 with the uh, annexation of Crimea. And then just a few days after the conclusion of the Beijing Olympics and before the Paralympics, right in, again in the middle of when this Olympic truce is supposed to go on, 
on February 24th, Putin launches his criminal war of aggression against Ukraine, which is still ongoing and Russia is not doing that well in. And this was basically an attack on all of Europe, on all liberal democracies, on all democratic rights that people had, and on the rights of all independent people to have their own governments. And this was seen very clearly by the reaction of so many countries around the world. Putin wanted to split NATO and steady strengthening NATO because you're going to soon have Finland and Sweden joining NATO and other countries want to join and other countries want to join the European Union, such as uh, Ukraine. And so it's all backfired. Recently, one of the top Russian envoys quit, denounced Putin, denounced the war, said he's ashamed of what his government is doing. And there have been lots of examples of this going on. So the IOC is, is in a big mess because they've shown, we've known this lesson historically. If you appease these type of aggressive, super authoritarian elements, it's only going to backfire on you. And so now he's singing crocodile tears about this whole, this whole situation. And this is also related to what's going on in the IBA, the International Boxing Association, formerly IEBA, the Olympic Boxing Federation, which re-elected in a Soviet-style uh, one-person election, uh, Umar Kremlev, who had been a Putin supporter of the Night Wolves uh, motorcycle group in Russia, because the opponent that wanted to run against him who, by the way, was an underdog and might have, might have lost, but he was disqualified. Boris Vandervost of the Netherlands was supposed to run against Kremlev. So 24 hours before the vote was to take place, they disqualified him, not leave on, on bullshit grounds, saying that he had collaborated, that he was part of another boxing organization, which he was not. They he he gotten together with a couple of other people from other national federations and wrote a letter trying to reason with Kremlev to democratize further IBA. And this was called electioneering when it wasn't electioneering. He wasn't calling for voting or electing anything. So what IBA was basically saying is you can't speak or talk with other members or issue statements unless they're already approved by the uh, the Politburo or, or, or whatever they call it of, of the IBA. And they did this 20, and they also disqualified these four members. This is probably more important since Van der Vos was, was an underdog in the election, four independent members of the board of directors, many of whom stood a good chance of getting elected. They were all disqualified and they did it so uh, close to the election that they didn't have time to appeal to the court of arbitration of sport, which said, look, did, did you, we, we, can't, we need a little time to figure this out. So the election went ahead and th there were some interesting results in the board of directors, but Kremlev was elected by acclamation. I mean, this reminds you of something in the, the days of, you know, Lenin, how they closed closed down democracy in the Soviets. You can read about that, and then Stalin and Khrushchev and Brezhnev and all these these different types of people, or the kind of elections they have in places today, like uh, Cuba and, and North Korea. And Bach, who wants to put on a pretense of all this being fair, criticized them. He said he's waiting for the Court of Arbitration for Sport to make the decision, but the worst he could say is a strange choice of words. And I don't know whether it's just Bach is a German and he's fluent in many different languages, but in English he said he's, quote, not amused by this controversy. Is it strange choice choice of words to say you're, you're not amused? So let's see what he says. But it was a total embarrassment to them. 
IVA is still dependent on the Russian state-run Gazprom energy giant for its funding. Gazprom announced it's going to be ending its sponsorship at the end of this year. And who else is going to fill this? Nobody. And why would any other sponsor other than somebody that would want to just take this whole thing over like uh, Gazprom in Russia did sponsor IBA? It, it looked there's a good chance they're going to be not allowed to run the Olympic boxing in Paris in 24. And boxing is not even on the schedule, the program for the Olympics in 28 in Los Angeles. Why would anybody spend money on them? Nobody, they have no TV deals. Nobody that I'm aware of, nobody's watching their fights. They do have obviously a lot of talented young amateur boxers in their ranks, but why would any major sponsor who loves to be associated with the Olympics, at, at least for now, sponsor the, the IBA? So the IBA is deep shit all around. And people looked at this election and go, here we go again. So it's very possible, judging on the comments of Bach and a longtime IOC member Dick Pound and others, that the IOC is going to simply wash the hands of this thing. Why the hell do we need boxing? There, not a lot of people really care about the sport. You had a fighter uh, die a few, several months ago in an IBA tournament. It's one scandal after another. It's all these problems. Why don't we bring in some of these other sports and put them on the main Olympic program, like skateboarding and some of these other things that may not interest you or I, but a lot of young people are interested in. So they want to skew young and weightlifting also has had its own a similar series of scandals, doping, uh, phony elections, governance, and all these types of things. So these sports are really on the chopping block and the effects of boxing, of getting rid of boxing as an Olympic sport means that in many countries, that dries up the government funding, not so much in the US, but that the, the government funds the mm -hmm. Olympic sports. If they drop it, who's going to fund amateur boxing? And so it's going to have a, a, a trickle down effect that's going to affect professional boxing eventually over the years. And it's part of the, the this long death saga of the sport of boxing that's going on. And of course, helping that along is uh, Czar Putin and his, his Russian right. regime. All right. So Eddie, what happens to the American USA boxing if uh, Aiba goes away or a, a, a Olympic boxing goes away? What happens to our, well, what, what happens to that program? That's, they, they're, gonna, they're gonna lose a lot of their, their funding and people going to them because one of the big reasons people go to those events is they want to become an Olympian. Right. They want to get an Olympic medal and eventually go on to the pros. And in the United States, there's a limit in, in most places, as far as I know, you have to be 18 years old to box as a professional. And in other countries, you can start at a younger age, such as Mexico. Mm. But what's going to happen, it's, it's just going to, it's going to limp along and it could, decline more and more. There are a lot of sports that are not Olympic sports that continue to exist, but they limp along. They don't have TV or streaming deals. They don't have much funding. They don't get a lot of the top athletes. And a lot of people are going to say the hell with it. Those young kids will say they're going to, to football or basketball. They're going mm -hmm. to something else. Maybe some of them might even return to a sport like, like baseball, or maybe some will try wrestling and or or try to go to uh, mixed martial arts or another martial art or something like that and the ioc has so many problems facing it and usa boxing is not an organization that people particularly love it's gonna it's gonna be bad overall for the sport of boxing but maybe good overall for the sports world and 
the physical and mental health of the athletes as something else uh, takes its place. I, I wow. just want to add on to that to say that it will have a devastating effect on the women's boxing program. Mm -hmm. Women's boxing has really thrived in the era of the Olympics. Until 2012, it was not given any respect at all on the amateur level. Well, enough so that there was actually movement and a push to engage women in the Olympics. They had a very successful Olympics in 2012, mm -hmm. 2016, and 2021. A lot of the movement that we are seeing in women's boxing now is precisely because of the excellence shown in the amateur programs globally, and specifically those women who have won Olympic gold have been able to cross into the pros and completely change the landscape of the sport. So if that goes away, it will have devastating effect on these young women's lives. I will also add that USA Boxing pays women to fight for them. So really? if, they, if, if women are, the elite team has support. They have place, they have lodging in, in Colorado. Right. They pay for their programs. Um, you know, they still have to raise money to assist in the Olympic side. Mm -hmm. But if you're an elite boxer on the team and you're a champion, you're getting some support from USA Boxing. That's good to know. And if there is, and, uh, you know, we just finished with the uh, the women's, uh, every two years is the women's world boxing. And that was sensational. And we have this young woman, uh, Rashida Ellis, who won gold. She was great. It's been incredibly important in Ireland. It's important all over the world. Mm. So uh, while there are issues on the men's side of the sport and a lack of support over the years, its impact on women in the sport is incalculable. Mm -hmm. And if the Olympics goes away, it will, it'll be worse than sticking a pin in a balloon. Right. It, it will really change the character of how things are done um, and, I, and will really push back a lot of the gains that have been made in the sport. Well, in terms of producing a tournament, you know, outside of the Olympics. I think that uh, USA Boxing could probably put something together like that. If you're saying they have funding, then they would only need sponsors to like, just say if the Olympics went away for boxing and that, that channel was wiped off clean for athletes, uh, elite amateur athletes to compete. I think USA Boxing could pull well, together something. Well, there are something. still, the, yeah. there is a, but this is the other effect of right. IBA. IBA not doesn't only do the Olympics. IBA does all international tournaments, which we're just finishing one, right? There's right. national, there's international tournament worlds, if you will, every year or every other year in boxing. So, and, so you're saying outside of the Olympics, they are the IBA, AIBA, sponsors IBA, everything, sponsors all of those amateur all international. international okay, I got all you. In, and not only at the elite level, but also at the junior level. Okay. And this is where a lot of young women are really coming to the fore in the United States. Right. Is they're coming through JO programs. And then they're getting sponsored and supported to go to international competitions at the JO level. Right. They're winning medals. There's also the Pan American Games. There's other types of tournaments that happen with regularity outside of the Olympics. And that is always where women competed. Okay. But if IBA goes under, it's not, it doesn't only affect the Olympics. It also so you're saying, uh, has all the these potential other right. of affecting all of international wow. um, <clears throat> amateur sports. Now, you know, the governance is different with IOC, but there's, there's the potential for impact. If Gazprom says, okay, we're done with you and nobody else steps up with money, then how are these international tournaments supported? Right. What is the umbrella organization over everything else? So that, that's... Gotcha. It's bigger than the Olympics. And okay. for women, it's devastating because they are just now being able to leverage those years of amateur experience. Someone mm -hmm. like Clarissa Shields had 80 right. fights, right? All right. Katie Taylor had 100 fights. They're winning European titles, national titles, different types of games. Okay. But without I, uh, <laughs> IBA, a lot of that goes away. Wow. Let's talk about women's boxing uh, right quick. Let's just segue into that. 
Sure. Uh, well, you know, we had uh, some some big fights this weekend. Uh, the first was Chantel Cameron, who's a um, uh, unified champion for WBC and IBF in the female super light title uh, or junior welterweight, depending on how, you, how you're how you counting it, for 140 pounds. Um, <clears throat> she was on... Uh, uh, she was on the road, what they called the road to undisputed, and was supposed to be um, facing the American fighter, Callie Reese, who has the WBA and WBO. Um, that fight didn't happen. Chantel also uh, was being managed by uh, MTK Global. So all of that's been in the mix for her. She was feeling, she in, in interviews over the last few weeks, she's been talking about how frustrated she's been, how she's questioned whether she even wants to be in boxing. But Eddie Hearn found her a fight. She fought uh, a former national champion, Victoria Noela Rustos, an Argentinian fighter. They went uh, to a 10 round um, UD decision. Uh, basically, one, one judge had it 100 to 90. Two of the other judges had it 99 to 91. That was really fair. Chantel put on a, a just a clinic and showed um, really a superior, true elite pro style boxing. Uh, so she's really ready for the next step. And the, the hope is that she will be able to face Callie Reese for the undisputed, for the opportunity to win undisputed at 140 pounds. If that does not come to pass, literally like the fight had, had been over 15 seconds and there was talk about, well, maybe she should go up to 147 and can contest Jessica McCaskill for all the belts. So something's gonna, something big is gonna happen with Chantel uh, and, and Deservedly so, because she's a really talented fighter. She's in the top 10 uh, ranking for the ring. I think she's in at number seven. Uh, we're discussing, you know, it's probably going to stay that way for a while, but she's definitely in the top 10 and worthy of being there. The other big fight this weekend is Delphine Pursuit. Ooh. She is back. She fought um, Elhem. Khalid uh, put on a master class against uh, an unbeaten fighter, really, really, really did a fantastic job. And uh, this was at 126 pounds. So it's the junior uh, lightweight. And that's um, <clears throat> Serrano's weight. Oh, it's, it's, so, <laughs> Was Look you over here matchmaking. Look you over here matchmaking. Big bit of news is that Serrano's, you know, her team sue put in a letter to WBA. I think it was WBA to say, do not take away her 126. She wants to contest for undisputed in that weight. She has earned the right. Do not take it away. So what she lost at the lightweight in that super fight. This was a four or five page letter. It looked like lit it was definitely written by a lawyer. <laughs> and they said, sure, honey, go for it. Wow. So we shall see what's going to happen with Amanda Serrano. Oh, boy. She's going to go after her stuff at 126. And then you got, you know, she, <laughs> that would be a fight I will pay to see. Right. <laughs> Delphi we're, we're all paying to two, see that fight. Two going, going forward fighters. Holy yeah. crap. That, talk Tell about a toe. beat down opportunity. Right. So some, <laughs> some of these women's fights are taking place in Dubai, right? Well, that particular fight took place in Dubai. It was on the car that uh, Mayweather uh, think, was on. Mayweather it was supposed to be exhibition. on or was on. Yeah, that exhibition card, but it was in Dubai. And a uh, friend of ours from Brooklyn, Serafina, was the, managed that for, she promoted it for. Uh, Wow. Delphine Pursuit. So that was awesome because, you know, she's gone from Melissa Hernandez into skyrocketing. So, you know, we were, right. we were cheering our Gleason's girl right. on that sense. So uh, really interesting doings. We'll see where all of this goes. Um, got a, a, another, uh, just quickly, another really good fight. This was on a DAZN card on the Chantel Cameron <clears throat> was uh, Ellie Scopey. Uh, Scott, oh, I've seen Scott, a couple Scott of her fights. Yeah, Scott. Ellie Scott. 
she also she just faced, fought a couple months ago, right? Yeah, she did. She fought a couple of months ago. She fought again. She uh, faced Maria Cecilia Roman, another former Argentinian champion who had lost to Ebony Bridges. <clears throat> Most recently, she fought a really good fight. You know, she's only five and zero, oh, and she had her, you know, an amateur background, and this brought her to five and zero. Oh. But she, you could see her learning round by round. I mean, it was kind of crazy to see how much she grew as she fought. So um, it, she's a, you know, she still has faults. She has things to learn, but she was working on the levels, working mm -hmm. on a lot of movement. She had great footwork and wow. uh, really wow. put on a great performance. So very exciting things to come in the way. Um, and that it's at uh, 122. Nice. So, that, so there's talk, I mean, you know, 15 seconds out of that fight. Whoa, Ebony Bridges at least got me. <laughs> we'll see. Exactly. I just I just want to add, keep an eye on what Dubai does in terms of Olympic boxing. If the Russians are in no position yeah. or can't do something because the, the United Arab Emirates, more the Abu Dhabi people, poured a lot of money into a little known uh, international federation that controls jiu-jitsu to try and push Brazilian jiu-jitsu and try and get that somehow into the Olympics. And the Dubai people we know have been running a lot of these boxing cards. And who has $30, 40000000 million just lying around to, oh, exactly. you know, well, to, that'd to be interesting. sponsor them? Keep an eye on if they're going to bother to do that. Just Well, just, you know, Given their like friendship with with more WBC and right. the the sanctioning bodies running there and looking for money, hoping to like make it the new mecca of boxing. I think you're right, Eddie. Yep. That's a really good call. Yep, that's it. So look, folks, that is all we have for you guys. The, the, today. That's the other thing. If, if certain forces like WBC, WBA, Vladimir Klitschko. You dropped out, Eddie. Can you hear me? I can yeah, now. My, I can now. My internet connection is just look for what the professional sanctioning bodies and Vladimir Klitschko and some others do to try to bail out Olympic boxing in addition to some of these players like Dubai. There's a lot more still could happen. Oh, that, yeah. Well, that, that would be the, the tonic it needs, that's for sure. Exactly. Although out of the fat into the fire, we'll see. Yeah, exactly. we will see. <laughs> all right, folks, that is all the time we have. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, smash that like button, turn the notifications on so you can check us out next time we drop video. Eddie, tell the people where they can find you, please. Twitter at NHB News. I just put up a new article about the rapid rise of Yoelvis Gomez on my Patreon at patreon.com slash Eddie Goldman. And, uh, you know, I'm all over the place online. That's right. So check, check it out. Check him out. Melissa, tell the people where they can find you. I am at Girl Boxing Now on Twitter and on uh, Instagram. Uh, I've also got a website, girlboxing.org. We'll be putting up some new content soon. Hoping all is great. That's right. And until next time, folks, I am your fight goddess. You can check me out on Twitter at Angry Afro Radio and on IG at fightgoddessfitness.com. I mean, I always say that fight goddess fitness. It's that fight goddess fitness, folks. All right. I'll see you guys <laughs> next time. Peace, love, and push-ups. Boom. I